بالله السميع العلي من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم dearest brothers and sisters viewers السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome to another session here with us on digging deeper here on Imar Hussein TV where we are exploring the dua that we recite almost every day hopefully every day after our daily prayers starting with Allahumma adkhil ala ahli al-qubur al-surur and inshallah in this session we'll be looking into the next line of the dua Allahumma ashbi' kull jaya as I'm sure you know by now but just to reiterate for those of you who it may be your first time watching this series we're using the incredible book entitled Manifestations of the All Merciful by Shaykh Khalfan to guide us through this great dua and as I've mentioned before if you would like to jump ahead you absolutely can because this book is readily available for you online at al-islam.org and I'm sure you can get a physical copy if you'd like but let's get going so Allahumma ashbi' kull jai oh Allah satisfy every hungry person now on the face of it it's not a, again, it's not a hugely deep and profound and, you know, oh, I need to contemplate on this kind of statement. I, I'm not here to, you know, take away the seriousness and the heaviness behind the statement, however. I'm more just saying, you know, in terms of like a, you know, I need to unravel the meaning behind it. It's, it's not one of those. It's quite clear cut. It's, oh Allah, satisfy every hungry person. Allahumma ashbara kulla ja'a. We will, of course, go a little bit deeper, but I just you know, wanted to say that at the beginning that it doesn't really come across initially as something very depthful, but that there is something really interesting within this. And I think it's one of my favorite lines in the du'a, but we'll come to it. Now, as I mentioned, on the surface level, this is still a very profound and weighty statement. I just gathered a few stats here for us to really recognize, actually, how important an issue this is so we don't just kind of gloss over it. Um, the, UN, the UN's Food and Agricultural Organization actually estimates that there are about 815 million people in the world who are hungry, i.e. who are suffering from chronic undernourishment. So not just hungry, actually, chronic undernourishment. 815 million people, that's about 11% of the world's population. Of them... 9.1 million, 9.1 million die every year from starvation or hunger. That's the equivalent to around 25,000 people per day dying of starvation. So whilst I'm saying, yes, it's not a, you know, a line that we have to really unravel and unpick words, etc. It still has a very profound uh, weight to it in the current climate that we live in and it's not something that we should underestimate to look into this though we'll start again on a relatively simplistic level in that the first lesson that we take of it is really related to i guess what we're doing in this month largely which is fasting now of course when you know you're asked okay what's the significance of fasting when when you study and listen to more and more things you learn that the the reasons there are a plethora of reasons as to why fasting is such a uh, incredible form of worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala something that takes us so close to him and something that's so dear to him and so useful for us to get closer to him however one of the typical things that we usually taught and that is usually on the tip of our tongues is that we fast because it helps us realize the challenge of those who are not as fortunate as us, as us the rich, if you like, because we have food readily available. And there's actually a, 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 a hadith attributed to Imam Sadiq, where he discusses the philosophy of fasting. And he says, and I'll quote, 
Allah, the exalted and glorious subhanahu wa ta'ala, desired to maintain equality between his creatures and make the rich person experience hunger and pain so that he may have pity on the weak and mercy on the hungry one. I think pity is not a great translation there, but we get the gist of it. So that we can experience the pain such that we can look upon those who are hungry with mercy. So we can feel for them, so that we can do something about it. And as I mentioned in a previous session, that, you know, alhamdulillah, there is some great initiatives that happen during Shah Ramadan, specifically around giving to those less fortunate than us. And that is another highly advisable form of worship and ibadah for us during this holy month, which is to give in alms and charity and sadaqah. So to begin with, I think, you know, let's let's just recognize on a surface level that number one, this is a very, very, very critical problem that still goes on in the world. And number two, this is a chance in this month, at least, for us to recognize the benefits that we obviously have by having food readily available at the table. But I do want to pose this question, which is, with that being said, how many of us, myself included, my family included, my friends included, still feel guilty of excessive consumption in this month and potentially wastage. And that's a hard-hitting question. It's not one that I think many of us are like, oh, I've never thought about it that way. No, no, we're all fully aware of it. But considering the state we're in at the moment, maybe it's something for us to actually really try and reflect on. There's a very clear message in, in that line that, yes, oh Allah, satisfy the hunger of everyone who's hungry, but am I taking what I have for granted? Am I actually being wasteful in what I have? And also am I trying to do something to solve those people's hunger? And as I mentioned before, it's something about saying these lines of the da'a, but more so deeper down, do we actually believe it? Do we have conviction in it? Do we actually want to solve the hunger crisis in the world because if we do i don't think the characteristic of one who does would be to be so wasteful in their consumption of food especially in a month that's meant to be about restraint and control of yourself and own desires but as soon as maghrib hits as soon as sunset hits that's out of the window so that's just one first lesson for us to take away now to go into this in, in, in a bit more of a different lens, different angle, and I really find this an amazing topic of discussion. And that is that when we read this line of the du'a, oh Allah, satisfy the every hungry person. My question is, who is a hungry person? Who is someone who is hungry? We mentioned in the previous session who is the faqir? Who is the poor? Is it just the person that I see in the street who doesn't have a house to live in, therefore is living on the street? Or um, then at that point we realize that maybe I am the poor because I am completely reliant on the only rich entity ever, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because everything ends up with him. Similarly here, when we say satisfy every hungry person, is the hungry person... Just the one who is hungry for food? Or is there another definition for hungry in this respect? Or hungry for food? Is there another definition for food? Now when we look to the Qur'an, and this is quite interesting, Qur'anic terminology, food does not always refer to the materialistic understanding of food. Which, once we understand what it can relate to, actually you know, it makes us see this entire line from a completely different angle entirely. So, in Quran, we have clear references, or sorry, in, in the Quran, we, we have different understandings of the word for food. And one of those that is pointed to um, actually comes from Surah number 80, Surah Abasa. And this word ta'am in Arabic for food in this Verse, the verse goes, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, فَلْيَنْظُرِ الْإِنسَانُ إِلَىٰ طَعَامِهِ Then let man look at his food. 
So you're probably now thinking, why, why did they make such a big deal out of it? Because that doesn't sound very miraculous. Then let man look at his food. And I'm saying that maybe there's a different translation. Of course, Ahl al alayhi wasalam have given us the answers to what is behind this verse. And this is where this answer comes as to what is this new translation, if you like, or new understanding of food. So in relation to this surah, um, in the Tafsir al-Burhan by Sayyid Hashim Bahrani, the Sayyid quotes a tradition that is narrated in Al-Kafi, attributed to Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, where a man called Zayd al-Shaham comes to the Imam and asks him, asks Imam Sadiq, this man's food that is spoken about in this ayah, what does it actually mean? What does it stand for? And the Imam alayhi salam, Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, is reported to have said, to have replied, عِلْمُهُ الَّذِي يَأْخُذُهُ عَمَّنْ يَأْخُذُهُ the knowledge that he acquires, from whom does he acquire it? So this is the Imam responding to a man asking him in this surah, Al-Abasa, verse 24, Then let man look at his food. What is this food? What is this man's food? What is this actually talking about? And the Imam says, The knowledge that he acquires, from whom does he acquire it? So I'll Put it into translation, then let man look at his knowledge that he acquires, from whom does he acquire it? So now we see a new translation, if you like, or a new lens by which to see the word ta'am in Arabic, typically meaning food, now being the understanding that this food is actually knowledge. Just to look at that hadith in its own isolation, the knowledge that he acquires, from whom does he acquire it? Maybe it's a command from the imam to say, go and analyze, where have you got your knowledge from? Look at your knowledge, assess it, where has it come from? Just be wary which sources you're using. Anyway, that's that's a side point. So what we're trying to understand here was, in this line, Allahumma ashba' kulla jaha, O oh Allah, satisfy every hungry one, i.e. the one who is hungry for Food, as we would typically understand it, the Imam is now saying, or through this we can understand that there's a different understanding of the word of food, which is now knowledge. O oh Allah, satisfy every hungry one, and maybe how we can understand it now, the one who is hungry for knowledge. Question. Surely we're all hungry then? Because we should all be hungry for knowledge. Because... We know the Prophet said, وَقُلْ رَبِّ زِدْنِي عِلْمًا That very famous prayer that many of us say in our daily salah, in our qunut, and say, O oh my Lord, increase me in my knowledge. The Prophet is in ongoing and unlimited pursuit of knowledge. It never ends. And Ahl al-Bayt and of course us. Allah's knowledge is infinite and it's constant. And we're in pursuit of this, just like the Prophet is. Oh my Lord, increase me in my knowledge. But how many of us are truly in pursuit of knowledge? How many of us are hungry for knowledge? How many of us are trying to take time out to learn, to develop, to seek knowledge? Coming back to that first premise we mentioned in the intro, it needs to be something, this du'a needs to be something that we really believe, that it's something from within. Are we just saying, yeah, Allahumma ashbaq kulla ja'ya, okay, and I'm wasting food on the table, and I really don't actually care about seeking any knowledge, let's just get this done with. There needs to be that yearning for it. You see, scholars in the holy seminaries, in the seminaries in the holy cities, and they've been studying for 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 years, and they're still at it. We had another book. Yet another thing they're listening to, yet another this, yet another that. It's never ending. And this is a question for us, you know, I think one beautiful thing that Shah Ramadan gives us is that, and it's actually quite similar to this quarantine that we're experiencing, it gives us time that I don't think we realised we had. Or at least we deprioritize certain things, which made that time get full. And now we go, you know what, maybe I've got time to reflect. I really think, you know. Am I actually bothered about seeking knowledge? Is that actually an important thing for me or so so? Allahumma ashba' kulla ja'a. Satisfy every hungry one. Maybe that's a dua for us to go satisfy my craving for knowledge. Now, Shaykh Al-Fan goes on in the book to then, he talks about the uh, the more 
um, common understanding of hungry eye, hungry for food. And it's worth reading that. We're not going to cover that uh, in, in our session, but it's highly, I highly recommend that you, you have a read through that chapter because it's quite interesting as to how he discusses those who go hungry and, you know, why that can be the case, etc. Uh, but we won't look at that just now. I just want to continue on this trend of knowledge, which is that the question then becomes, okay, if we're hungry, the way to satisfy that hunger is, of course, to eat. And Sheikh Al-Fan talks about how you can get that food if you haven't got it. What What is it that you need to do? And equally, from a knowledge perspective, how do you actually go about satisfying that hunger for knowledge? How do you go about satiating yourself? And actually, the solution for the more materialistic notion of food and then the knowledge side of food, if you like, the solution is common. And we'll just focus on the larger side, but we'll look to the Quran for the answer. In Surah Al Baqarah, chapter number two, verse 282, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, wa yu'allimukum Allah. And adopt what Allah, adopt taqwa, and Allah will teach you. You're hungry for knowledge. Allah saying, I will teach you on the premise that you adopt taqwa. What taqullah. And equally in Surah Al-Anfal, Surah number 8, verse 29. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, in tattaqullah yaj'al lakum furqana. O believers, if you be, or if you have taqwa, I'm going to be careful of how I uh, translate taqwa. So, O oh believers, if you have taqwa, Allah shall enable you to distinguish the truth from the falsehood. So we see that taqwa is a prerequisite or is the solution to satisfying your hunger for knowledge. Fine. We can now stop here and say, okay, finished. Khalas, thank you for this session, etc. Because now we know that I need to occur and have taqwa. The question now is, what is the meaning of taqwa? And I smile because uh, every single time that I've sat with someone of, 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 of great knowledge or of knowledge, they've always said, uh, we've always had a session about taqwa, basically. Like it's, it's a very important thing that they'll always turn around and go, okay, cool, and this, is, this requires taqwa, who knows what taqwa means? And then there's this whole discussion that, oh, is it piety or is it not piety? It's not piety, okay, what it is. So I want to very briefly explain uh, what taqwa is from one of these lessons that we sat in just so and this is not in the book um, I think he alludes to it slightly uh, but there's a plethora of, of work around what taqwa actually means and I'm just going to give you um, a small glimpse into that because I think it's quite useful for us to for us to conclude on inshallah and to reflect on as well so usually when we hear the word taqwa, the first thing that usually comes to our mind is probably something like piety. And then I usually ask, what does piety mean? Because honestly, I couldn't tell you what pious means. The only thing that comes to my head when someone says pious is that I think of a guy in a cloak who's very polite and very, you know, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. And then that's, that's all I really think about it. So I don't find it a very useful uh, translation. And I think scholars would say it's not a very accurate translation either. So what is taqwa? So... Taqwa comes from wiqaya, which comes from hif, which means to protect. So the question now is to protect what and from what? So someone with taqwa, i.e. someone who protects themselves, a muttaqi, they're protecting their nafs. They're protecting themselves against evil. Against indecency. I'm saying that taqwa from waqaya comes from hif, which means to protect. I'm saying this is a protection of your nafs against evil and indecency. And by doing so, the result of this protection is that you have awareness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're aware that Allah is watching. That's why you're doing this. You're aware that he's watching. So sometimes we'll hear people say, okay, it doesn't mean piety, but it means God consciousness. But actually understanding the whole, you know, story behind it, that it's you're aware 
that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching your every step. That as I record this, I know he's watching me. I know he's looking into my intention. I know he's looking into my heart. I know he's looking into, has everything that I've bought to make this happen from a halal income, etc. I know he's watching my every single move. And as a result, I am extremely careful to protect myself from evil, from indecency, from anything that is negative. Constant protection. This is one basic understanding of taqwa. And if I were to summarize it in, in this way, we're familiar with the notion of tawbah, of repentance, seeking forgiveness. Tawbah is needed after you've committed a wrongful act. Whereas taqwa is the protection of your soul before you commit the act because you're wary of Allah watching over you. You want to protect yourself. You want to protect your soul. And we spoke about this, we, we've come onto this discussion because we said that taqwa is a solution or is a, is a prerequisite to satiating yourself from that hunger of knowledge, of seeking knowledge. So it's a really beautiful discussion that, you know, can go on and, you know, I highly recommend that you go to those who you know that are learned to, to dig into this notion of taqwa because it really is a, a never-ending discussion. This just gives a different way of, inshallah, thinking about it. So, Allahumma ashbi' kull ja'i, four main kind of points that we've looked into. Firstly, that it's a very explicit line that I think gives us a stark reminder of the hunger that we see in the world today. And we spoke about some of those statistics. 850 million experiencing hunger. 9 million dying per year. I.e. 25,000 per day. So it's still a stark problem that faces that we face day in, day out, day out. And as a result, it's important for us that we, we aren't excessive. Especially during this month. Especially during this ibadah that we're doing. It doesn't make sense to then be excessive. It's kind of defeating the purpose. And it's something for us to check ourselves on. Are we, are we just saying satisfy the hungry ones. But I'm you know, abusing the food that I have. And the, the wealth and sustenance and risk that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me. Second, we then said that, you know, of course there is this clear reminder for us as those much more fortunate and alhamdulillah for the blessings that we have that fasting is a time for us to have an understanding a glimpse of an understanding into the challenge and difficulty that those who are much less fortunate than us go through and therefore we can have mercy on them and try to help them and actively help them so we actually enact on this line of the du'a that we recite we then took a completely different dimension into this discussion by looking at the response attributed to Imam Salih alayhi salam in relation to the verse in Surah Abasa, where it's talking about this notion of food, and this notion of food actually was then seen as knowledge, and this you know really opened up our discussion into thinking: Are we hungry for knowledge? For knowledge is infinite, and are we pursuing it genuinely? And are we hungry for it? And if we are hungry for it, one way to satiate that hunger is by having taqwa and then we concluded by looking into a slightly you know deeper understanding of the word taqwa but still very surface level so inshallah that concludes on the line of allahumma ashba' kulla ja'a ilahi ameen and inshallah you'll join us for the next line of this dua wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh oh.